is Jeannie here today. I'm so glad to be joined by the frontman of the Pandora Billionaire Club, multi-platinum rock band Skillet, John Cooper, who's also an author, a graphic novelist, a video game creator, an influencer, podcast hoster, so many things. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you so much. It's so great to be here. I'm, I'm excited and thanks for such a nice introduction. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you made it hard for me. You do a lot of different things. Um, so <laughs> it, it's impressive and it's amazing. I love what you do for the Lord. Today, we're here to talk about your new album, Dominion. So we know what the old school kind of spiritual definition of Dominion is, but what is Dominion for you? Yeah, the record is officially out and I am so excited. Um, you, you know how it is, whether you, you do a book or a, a, your music or whatever it is that you're doing, presentation at your work, man, that feeling when it's out, you feel like you had, the, you had a baby. You know? yes, <laughs> anyway, yes. so it feels good to finally have it out and uh, I'm excited that the fans are listening to it and it's a very, I hope, encouraging record. Dominion. You know, it, it, it's funny when I talk about this because I do so many different interviews with so many different kinds of people. I'm excited that I can talk about the deep level of dominion. Yes, you know I mean? let's go. <laughs> yeah, because sometimes, you know, you have to give like a 10 second thing um, because, uh, you know, uh, music, songs, and they always have different layers, you know, like, so the, the initial layer, if you will, is, is basically, this record is called Dominion. It's talking about, it's a celebration of freedom. I, and I think that, that that has a ton of layers to it as well. One of the things you'll hear on the record a lot is this sort of freedom from fear because yeah. you know the way I see it, probably the way a lot of people see it, the whole world is, is suffering from being just captives to fear right now. Right. Not to say there's nothing worth being frightened about. There's a lot of weird mm -hmm. stuff going on, that's true. But we don't have to be ruled by fear. Now, if you're a Christian, then you sh may not be ruled by fear because the word says, uh, God says, you don't have a spirit of fear, but a spirit uh, uh, of power, love, and a sound mind. So there's a lot of different levels to this dominion. And it only became, um, I only became aware recently of, because you just said like the, I think, how did you say the older spiritual The term? old school, old spiritual, yeah, the <laughs> older school spiritual term, yeah. I didn't even know that I, I only kind of recently picked up on that with someone else's interview. I was like, well, I don't really know what that means, but the, but on the deep level for me, what, what this is about is I have a real love for uh, uh, Puritans and um, that sort of theology of, of what we would call like sphere sovereignty. And it's the way that under the Lordship of Christ, that he has given authority to me as an individual, you as an individual, over my mind and my body that I am supposed to rule, of course, under the Lordship of Christ. And then me uh, over my family and the church has its sphere of authority and the government has a sphere of authority. But really all of that is a celebration of Jesus Christ who owns the world. He is the Lord of, of, of the universe. He's the Lord of the nations. And the reason that was so on its kind of deep level, what it's so meaningful to me is that we're living in a time that the government is trying to act like God. And, mm -hmm. and that has become like an idolatrous, you know, statist philosophy. When the government is trying to be, I'm, we're the God, we're the father, we're gonna tell you what is righteous. And in fact, Christians, we're gonna shut you up because we know what's righteous and you Christians are wicked. Now that is a, an absolute idolatrous government. And so mm -hmm. I don't get to talk about that a lot, but that is part of what I'm really passionate about in this, this idea of dominion, mm -hmm. it's a celebration of freedom, but true freedom is only found in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's, that's definitely super deep. And, and, you know, I, I do love that about you. You're very bold, in what you say. And, and I, you know, it's, um, it's obvious that, you know, like your authority in Christ because you're so bold, you know, in an age where other people, especially with people that have a platform like you, you know, they're afraid to kind of speak out against, you know, uh, the powers that be because of what, you know, fear of what they might lose or things like that. 
Um, talk about a little bit more about this freedom. You know, uh, we're Christians and you know, I'm, I'm a millennial and sometimes I can get riled up and I'm like, you know, we gotta take back what's ours, you know, like <laughs> we go forward and it's like a revolution. <laughs> so how do we as Christians, um, how do we kind of hold on to that fear in, in a very real reality where, I mean, not fear, the freedom, we're in a very real reality where, you know, there is this fear mongering uh, for us to shut up or, or we're being hateful, or, you know, trying to suppress uh, the freedom that's ours. How do we do that in a way that honors God and, and keeps our witness? Because obviously we still have a world out here to, to win for Jesus without, uh, you know, going to the extreme, I would say. I know exactly what you mean. I don't know if I have any good answers, but I'll talk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I will never you're, not talk. You're but... radical. You're radical too. Uh, <laughs> we're, yeah. We'll be figuring it out together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, maybe. We'll see. No, I mean, I, I think you bring up some great points. And, and I think it's worth mentioning uh, that I think there's a lot of reasons that, that we are kind of where we're at and why people don't speak up. Some of those reasons I don't think are all, um, in other words, I don't want to like demonize everybody that doesn't, I don't know, speak up the way maybe that I speak up or the way you speak up. There are some people I think that have had <clears throat> really good intentions, but I'm not sure it has produced something really good. All right. And what I mean by that is this. I've been a musician, a Christian musician now for 25 years, which is crazy. And um you know, a lot of people said, John, <clears throat> why have you become like so outspoken in the last few years? Now, I've always, I think, been quite outspoken about my faith. It shows and this and the other. But I, something has changed in culture to, that has made it all of a sudden where I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's now or never. It, it, mm. it, it's different than it used to be. And I think a lot of us, I would say me included, 10 years ago, I still was struggling with what is the best way to reach the lost, you know, maybe the best way to reach the lost isn't to go on a podcast and start laying down the gospel and talking about how the wicked are going to perish if they don't bow their knee to Jesus Christ. Maybe that's not the best way to win the loss. And so there's been this sort of niceness, you know, wanting to make peace with the world. But I don't mean this from a cowardly perspective. I mean, from a, we want to be loving. We want to show people that we accept them even if they are sinners, we don't, we, we don't judge you. It's not, it's not up to me if someone, if, if the Holy Spirit is regenerating someone's heart. I can't make that happen, so I have no judgment towards them. Some of those things have not been because of cowardice. It is because of, of politeness and niceness. And I think what I would like to say is I don't think that's working. And I think we had a wrong, in my view, definition of what being loving was and being polite. And I, and, and I thought about it like this recently because I was traveling. <laughs> Have you noticed that we live at a time, if you get on a plane, the person next to you that's not a Christian, they are not shy at all about telling you what they believe, right? They are not shy at all about yelling about who knows what. I mean, maybe their hatred for uh, traditional marriage or Christianity in general or Christian schools or churches that are open when they shouldn't be open and they're not wearing masks. They'll tell you what they think about everything. And they're not shy about it at all. And why should we be shy about the, what we believe is the truth? So I guess what I would say is just this, we celebrate freedom in Christ <clears throat> no matter what happens. And if the worst ever happens, I mean like the gulag, if the very worst happens, then we celebrate Jesus Christ in the gulag and the Holy Spirit will do an incredible work, I believe, just like he did in the New Testament. You know, Paul's in prison. What does he do? He leads the prison guards to the Lord. We have all sorts of testimonies of that actually from the gulag times and from during a lot of these like statist dictatorships and they're arresting Christians and all of a sudden guards are getting saved because you cannot stop the move of the Holy Spirit, and you mm -hmm. cannot stop the gospel of the kingdom from invading people who do not expect it because they see it. So we celebrate that freedom in Christ, even if the extreme worst happens. And I don't think that's going to happen, by the way. I'm just saying 
no matter what happens, the gospel cannot be quenched. And so for me, I think we got to get loud about our faith. Some Christians think that when I, that people like me, I don't know, maybe people like you, they might say, you guys, you're just, uh, what is the word they use? They say that we are, what are they called about your individual freedoms? Like you are, you're boasting about your freedom or something. I don't remember the word that they use when they're like, there's no reason to boast about freedom and this, that, and the other. I believe that we need to fight for these individual rights in our country because it, it, it makes it the most uh, viable to share the gospel. We are still free to talk about our faith. I don't know why we would be so quick to give up those individual freedoms. It's not about boasting. It's not about praising America. It's about recognizing um, one of the great things that our founding fathers did do, which was very unusual in that they recognized a higher power over the authority of the state. That mm -hmm. is an incredible, unique thing that our founding fathers did. And we should celebrate that because that, in my view, is a godly, uh, the way a godly government should, re I'm not saying that America did everything right. I'm only mm -hmm. saying that to recognize that Christ is Lord or that even that there is a God over the state and the state may not intrude into personal rights, that is a really wonderful thing. We should not be quick to, to give that up in my opinion. Yeah. Amen, absolutely. Let me ask you this, since you have been way more outspoken or that's what it appears to be um, to others, how's that been? How's the, you know, dealing with mm. what comes with that, the backlash or the support or just being that voice? And it's, it's interesting, right? Because you do stand out in the sense uh, among your peers in Christian music, period, of somebody that is just really out here sharing, you know, the truth in love. Um, yeah. How how's it been for you just dealing with uh, the, the comments and the things that come with it? <laughs> well, it's not always awesome. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, you know, I think I, it, it, you know what's really strange about it? The world has changed so much. When Skillet first started, you know, we were, we were kind of really known as being this way because we would, I would preach at concerts. I would preach in interviews. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that happened is because the internet, like the influencer, the podcaster, all these yeah. things happened. And all of a sudden I just realized if I'm going to make a difference in this generation, younger generation, I need to begin to do this more. And I didn't really know how. And so I, I kind of knew it would be a cost, but I'll tell you honestly what I did not expect. I knew there'd be a cost with some amount of fans that don't dig it, but that was okay, right? What I didn't know is there would be a personal cost, like in my friends. I'm like, Aww. yeah, some of my best friends that, that I didn't know that we even disagreed about stuff. And some of the, some of them are, are Christians and love God. And I love them. We still love each other, yeah. but I, there are some friends that I don't think do love me anymore because yeah. they, uh, it's almost like we had never come to this crossroads before. And mm -hmm. I didn't realize that when we talked about the faith together, that we weren't using the same definitions for things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. let, let me give you an example. Yeah. So people actually know what I mean. Yeah. What I mean is this. 20 years ago, 10 years ago, I had an assumption that if I, if I come on your podcast, uh, Jeannie, and me and you are talking about um, living and obeying the commands of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. me and you both kind of assume what that means is, well, the commands of Jesus Christ are clear because they're in the Bible. Right. Well, what gets really weird is if all of a sudden, after knowing you for 10 years, I find out that when you say the commands of Jesus Christ you're not talking about the Bible because you don't believe that the Bible is actually um, inerrant. You don't believe the Bible is actually the word of God. That's just written by men. But, but Jesus, only the words of Jesus are commands or something of that nature. All of a sudden, me and you are talking about a different faith. You, you, yeah. it, but, but I thought that we were talking about the same thing. That's happened in Christian music. That's happened in churches. That's happened to people watching this podcast right now at their own home churches with some of their family members. It's just yeah. all of a sudden it's ripped apart things. That is the cost that, that, that has been painful, to be honest. 
but that's okay because at least you're getting to the truth. I'd rather have the truth with the pain than to live in some sort of a lie. And yeah. so for me, it has cost me something on the business side, but that's okay because it's, it's done something greater, which I think is, is, give, is giving people a lot of hope. And it's giving a lot of Christians that feeling of, I knew I wasn't crazy. <laughs> hmm. you know, feeling, I know I wasn't the crazy one. You know, hmm. John said this, or Jeannie said this, or the Christian Post wrote this. And I knew that I wasn't the crazy person. And it, it's, so, it's so wonderful to know that there are other people also in the battle. That's a long answer, but that's my honest answer. Yeah, well, thanks for being honest. You know, it's, it is hard and it comes with a cost um, to be so vocal, but you know, you are a voice that's influencing people that really need it. So I thank you for that. Um, let's talk about some of the songs. I really loved Valley of Death. Um, you know, I feel like so many people have found themselves in that place, especially during these past couple of years where just death is all around, whether it's physical death, you know, which we've witnessed with the pandemic or, um, you know, just death to self or death to our ideologies or thoughts about what church was even, you know, things like that. Um, we all found ourselves in that place where it can have been, you know, could be really, really low. Talk about that and just kind of that song and how it came about and kind of encourage others who find themselves there. Well, Jeannie, you just went super deep. I love, <laughs> Sorry. I love, no, you're, you, you're peeling back the onion. That's what I'm talking about. It's sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you don't have the time to go deep, you know, uh, but, but you're absolutely right. Valley of Death can mean a great many different things, can't it? You know, it doesn't necessarily literally mean only on your deathbed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you feel like you're in the valley of death because you can't, you can't see where you're going. And, and I think that's one of the hard things about the pandemic for people is like, for instance, if, if I said to people listening now, hey, we're going to have a worldwide pandemic. <laughs> Nobody believe it if it was three years ago, but we're going to have a worldwide mm -hmm. pandemic. And it's going to last for a year. It's going to be really hard, but it's only a year. Well, if you know it's only a year, you kind of prepare for it, don't you? You know, it's True. only going to be two years. You prepare for it. The problem is, is that you don't know if it's ever going to end. And yeah. I think that, that causes this. Are my kids ever going to go back to school properly? Are we mm -hmm. ever going to get on a plane without my three-year-old having to wear a mask and getting yelled at and my kids crying and freaking out? Yeah. Um, I tell you what really, I, I don't, everybody has their own sufferings, but I'll tell you what really bums me out are these old people, who, our grandmas and our grandpas who are, are dying alone because mm -hmm. of, uh, I, I just think I'm just, that makes me sadder than just about anything. I cannot imagine living your life. Mm -hmm. You're 85 years old and you're not allowed to say goodbye to the people you love. I, I just think it's, I, that mm. strikes me as absolute uh, wicked, but either way, it's a bummer. The valley of death can be a lot of different things. And I think we all feel that to some degree over the last couple of years, sometimes life doesn't go the way you want it to. And sometimes life doesn't go the way you think that it should. But the promise that we have, and, and the song alludes to this, there's a line in the song that says, someone said, this is all part of the plan, but I don't understand. There's nothing wrong with saying that to God. There, mm, you know, I, I, even, I even think of John the Baptist, who in the old covenant, there was, you know, Jesus said, no one, none of the prophets are as great as John the Baptist, right? For, for the old covenant. John the Baptist, remember when he's in prison and he's like, okay, he sends his guys to go find Jesus. And he's like, are you the one we've been waiting for? Or, or was I wrong? Like, did I miss this? because this isn't looking like what I thought it was going to look like, you know? When I read that about John the Baptist, that is so real to me because John the Baptist was a prophet. The spirit spoke through John the Baptist and yeah. he knew Jesus was the one, but then things weren't going the way he thought they were gonna. And I go, man, if that can happen to John the Baptist, it right. can happen to me. So um, that is a little bit what the song is about, but it, it's an encouragement that, Yes, we all feel this way sometimes. I don't understand what God's doing, but what I know for sure is that all things work together for the good of those who love Christ according to his purposes. God's going to use it for his glory. He's doing a work in my life and in your life, 
in the nation. He's doing a work that is going to be for his own glory. And it may not look like what we wanted it to, but I find a lot of peace and, and security in that because in the end, I would trade my aspirations so that Jesus would be glorified. Most people that are Christians would be like, okay, yes, I would do that as well. The hard, the difficulty is knowing that that's what's happening. You're, so we just have to trust that that's what God's doing. And it, yeah. it helps us rearrange our, for me, it helps me rearrange my mind. Yeah. You know, speaking of mind and um, just kind of in line with what you're talking about, when listening to the album, you know, I, there was this sense of spiritual warfare, like real, like I, I can, I get that you understand spiritual warfare, you know, and, 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 and the, the, the way you, you're able to be hopeful in situations that seem hopeless. And, you know, regardless of the attacks of the enemy, you know, you talk about battling demons, you know, um, in, 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 in your song, Destroyer, for instance, you know, it's that, it's that, fight you know it's that war song um against the enemy can you talk a little bit to that that spiritual warfare aspect because to be honest john a lot of people are defeated or or get defeated or stay defeated because they don't understand the the importance of that spiritual warfare that fight that there is for for us to you know believe god over the attacks of the enemy mm. oh that's really good um, yes, there is a lot about this spiritual war that is going on. Now, some people love talking about spiritual warfare. Some people go like, oh, that's starting to sound kind of kooky. You know, yeah, like, like exactly. they're thinking, oh, it's only sounding like some mystical whatever. But the thing is, is that the Bible talks about it. And this is how I meant it, specifically in the song Destroyer, which is, that song's a banger. All right. That song yes, is, it so is heavy. It's so cool. <laughs> But what, what I, what, where that com comes from is this, how, you know, we are to demolish, if you